Our next video comes from the current governor of Wisconsin. Ladies and gentlemen, how will Scott Walker provide opportunity for all and favoritism to none? My record shows that I know how to fight and win. Now more than ever, America needs a president who will fight and win for America. To do that, we need new, fresh leadership. Leadership with big, bold ideas from outside of Washington. The kind of leadership that knows how to get things done, like we've done here in Wisconsin. America is a great country. We just have to start leading again. It's not too late. We can do it because we've done it before. And if you work hard and you play by the rules, you can do and be anything. That's the American dream, and that is worth fighting for. I'm for transferring power from Washington into the hands of hardworking taxpayers in states all across the country. That's real reform. Americans deserve a president who will fight and win for them. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Governor Scott Walker. Governor, your, your first question will come from Bill. Governor Walker, I have two sons in the United States Navy. Now, you have vowed to overturn President Obama's Iran deal on day one of your presidency. Joe Biden has said that if we reject a deal, we'll be in a weaker position and that we'll be unable to, to craft a bigger deal from that weakened position. So is it possible to overturn an international agreement that will have been in place for more than a year when the next presidency begins? Yes, and first off, thank you to your sons. I think we all owe his sons and everybody else in the military a round of applause. I have two sons, and I'm proud of Matt and Alex, but I know you're particularly proud of them for their service, and we appreciate that. Uh, and I want to tell you, by the way, if I'm President of the United States, I will not send your sons or anyone else's sons or daughters in the harm's way unless our national security interests are at risk no more, no less. It should only be about national security. It shouldn't be pawns of the diplomats or politicians in the White House. It should be to secure our national security interests. But in terms of the Iran deal, on day one, I would terminate that deal on day one. I said that earlier this year. Barack Obama said I needed to bone up on foreign policy. How about that from the guy who called ISIS the JV squad and Yemen a success story? It's about time he boned up on what Americans really care about. And so, yes, we should terminate that bad deal. We should reinstate the sanctions that Congress has already authorized. Going forward, we should work with the Congress to put in place even more crippling sanctions on top of that. And as president, it won't be easy. But when has anything that's been important for America ever been easy? We should convince our allies to do the same. And I want to send a clear message out there. If you're thinking about doing business in Iran, if I'm president, you've got a choice. You can either do business with Iran or you can do business with the United States of America. You can't do business with both. You see, there, there's a reason for this. Think about that. I remember as a kid still tying yellow ribbons around the tree in front of our house during the 444 days that Iran held 52 Americans hostage. 52 Americans hostage. They haven't changed much in the last three and a half decades. And about time we stood up and took notice and said, you know what, you want to do a deal? You can do it on our terms. I said this the other night, but the president is a not a very good negotiator. I'd love to play cards with him because he folds on just about everything when it comes to this Iran deal. You want to do a deal with us, Iran? Here's the conditions. Completely dismantle your nuclear infrastructure, fully disclose, including your underground fortified facilities, and deal with the problems that you have with the destructive behaviors, not the least of which is, if we lift these sanctions, that money's not going to go in to help the Iranian people many of whom want to be free of this oppressive regime that's in charge now, it's going to go into terrorist activities with groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and others who directly want to target Israel. Unless you give that up, we're not going to do a deal with you now or any time in the future. 
Governor Walker, in Wisconsin, you supported beneficial tax treatments for the agriculture and manufacturing industries. Some have also said that the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation represents a form of corporate welfare. Are these policies fair to companies that don't get those benefits, and would you bring them to the federal government in Washington, D.C.? Well, one of the best things we can do with the federal government is take money and power out of Washington and send it back to the states. To me, I just heard a little bit of Jeb there a second ago. I think you don't just do it in education. I take all the education money out of Washington. In fact, you take a dollar out and you take it out of your purse or your wallet and you look at it. Where would you rather spend this dollar? In Washington, where they skim money off the top and give you pennies on the dollar? Or would you rather spend it right back here in South Carolina and states like it across the country? I'd rather spend my money back here. So whether it's in education, transportation, Medicaid, environmental protection, workforce development, I would take the power and the money out of Washington and send it back to the states where it's more effective, more efficient, and definitely more accountable to the American people. Now, now let's be clear for a minute though, this isn't going to be easy. Not just because of the Democrats. There's going to be a lot of Republicans in Congress who aren't going to like that much because there's a fiefdom for each of those different areas out there. And that's why you've got to look hard at this election because there's a lot of great people. You saw it the other night at the debates. But your question shouldn't just be what did they say and not even just what have they done, but who's got the capacity to stand up and take on those groups. You see, in Wisconsin, I took on not just the unions, I took on the Washington-based special interests, and at some points, even members of my own party. And at one point, there were more than 100,000 protesters in our state capitol. More than 100,000. You know what? The help of many of you here and others across the country, we didn't back down. They issued death threats against me and against my family. They issued threats. We didn't back down. They tried to take us to federal and state court, and we didn't back down. They tried to recall my state senators, and we didn't back down. They tried to recall me in the re-election, and we didn't back down. And last year, they made me the number one target in America in the re-election. We didn't back down. I didn't back down then. I'm not going to back down against Washington. Governor Walker, in Wisconsin, you signed an abortion ban at 20 weeks, and you also defunded Planned Parenthood. In Washington, D.C., frankly, it feels like Republicans love to run away from any real fight on pro-life issues. Do you think Planned Parenthood should be defunded at the federal level, even if Barack Obama forces a shutdown over the issue? Absolutely, Planned Parenthood should be defunded. And this is exactly what's wrong with Washington. You see, in my state four years ago, a state that hasn't elected a Republican since 1984, we defunded Planned Parenthood long before these videos because it was the right thing to do, and we put that money into women's health that wasn't in Planned Parenthood. If we can do that in a Democrat state like Wisconsin, why can't we do it in Washington? Why can't we do it in Washington? And I don't buy this nonsense about all the Senate rules, 60, 60 votes out there. I gotta tell you something. You know what? The Democrats don't play by those rules. They passed Obamacare with 51 votes. It's time we sent the president a bill that defunded Planned Parenthood with 51 votes in the United States Senate. And you don't have to buy into this talk that the media says about shutdowns. We're not talking about shutdowns. We're about sending a bill to the president that reasonably and responsibly defunds, defunds Planned Parenthood and puts that money into women's health in other areas that are non-controversial. The president is the one who's willing to, de to stop and shut down the government. We're not. We're not. You know what we're standing for? We're telling the rest of America that we don't want any more of those videos. Those videos are outrageous, not just to people like me and many of you here who are pro-life. I think the vast majority of Americans say what they saw on those videos was disgusting. And America wants leadership in Washington that will once and for all stand up and say, that cannot happen in America. When I'm president, that will never happen again.
Governor Walker, you're in favor of defunding Planned Parenthood, even yet you were a critic of the defund Obamacare effort two years ago. What's the difference between the two issues in your mind? Well, when it comes to Obamacare, I've got a simple plan. It's called the Day One Patient Freedom Plan. And let me tell you about it, because I tried a little bit the other night, but I didn't quit quite enough time, so let me tell you about this as well. You see, the Day One Patient Freedom Plan is about repealing Obamacare entirely, entirely. and putting patients and families back in charge of your health care dollars and decisions. But get this, this is why we call it day one. On day one, we not only send the plan up to Congress, but to get them to act, to get them to act, not talk. Because you know what? I, I just want to back up for a second, because think about this. There's a reason why the media thinks that gatherings like this are full of angry people. And I look at you, you look like you got smiles on your face. You're not angry. I was just over in Spartanburg, when I talk to people across the country, they're not angry. You know what people are? It's not anger we're talking about, it's a sense of urgency. Not just urgency to take on Barack Obama, but we were told if the United States Senate went Republican along with the House, what would happen? They'd take a vote on repealing Obamacare. What's after Labor Day? Where's the bill to repeal Obamacare? I want to know where it's at. So, so here's my promise to you. If you elect me as president, not only will I terminate that bad deal with Iran on day one, on day one, I will send my plan to repeal Obamacare up to the Congress and to get them to act on day one, I will sign an executive order that makes Congress live by the same rules as everyone else in America. That should get them going. Governor Walker, one aspect of your health care plan is a refundable tax credit that goes to those without employer-based health insurance, some of whom are not taxpayers. Will all of the money that it costs to give those refundable tax credits, which some would call spending, come from the cuts in Medicaid, or would there be any tax increases on those who pay taxes? No, in our package, it's all about reform. And so we put in place reforms that allow the people of America to use their money. You remove the mandate, and then it's up to the American people. If you want to get health insurance and you don't have it for your employee, you can take the refundable tax credit and you can buy it. But if you don't, you don't have to. You can buy it over state lines. You can work together if you're a bunch of small business owners and farmers and ranchers. You can bunch it together. You can use that. And whether you get, employ and whether you get it through your employer, through your health insurance, or whether you want to go out and do it on your own, you get to use up to $1,000 to put into a health savings account so that you get to control your dollars. Because to me, in the end, the way we really control health care costs is not by the government doing it, but by people having more transparency, understanding more what they're spending it on, having real skin in the game. Think about if you've got your cell phone out right now, most of us in America probably know more about our cell phone plan than we do about our health care plan. I got two kids, I, my youngest just moved out of the teens, my youngest is now 20, my other one's 21, but I remember years ago when they were first teenagers, you know, we had to get unlimited texting, so we weren't in the poorhouse. We knew about that because we knew we followed our, our, our cell phone plan, most Americans don't do that, so I say do things that allow us as consumers of healthcare to follow where our dollars are going, so we pay attention to not just our dollars, but things like diabetes and high blood pressure and other things that drive up health care costs. And then one other key thing we add, we put an incentive on our plan to help states go forward and pass lawsuit reform so that medical professionals spend their time on medicine, not on preventative medicine to avoid lawsuits. But the key in all this, the key in all this, it starts all with repealing Obamacare entirely. We've been talking about this for years. And let me be clear, it's not just about repealing Obamacare. I think if you really want to get the economy going at a better level than it is now, and when I, I talked to a couple earlier in Spartanburg, and there's a lot of people like them, like their family across this country, you know, they're hurting. They're feeling the challenge of the economy. The economy has recovered for some, but not for many in this state and across this country. And part of getting things back on the right track, part of real growth and opportunity for everyone in this country isn't about more government. 
It's ultimately about getting government out of the way. You repeal Obamacare. You rein in the out-of-control federal regulations that are like a wet blanket on the nation's economy. You put in place an all-of-the-above energy policy. You know, we're actually an energy-rich country. We should start acting like it. I do things like lift the, 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 the uh, crude oil export ban and approve the Keystone Pipeline on day one as well. You help people get the education, education and skills that they need to succeed, and then you reform the tax code and lower the tax burden both on employers, but more importantly on individuals. If we do all those things collectively, we get the government out of the way and help the people of this country create more jobs and more opportunities for all. Governor Walker, many of our nation's cities are seeing increases in murders this, uh, this year. Many people accuse, say that that could be something called a Ferguson effect, namely a shifting of the equilibrium between police and offenders. Do you think a Ferguson effect is responsible for any of this crime increase, and what could be done? Well, first off, I, I think when it comes to the issue, not just of police, but of race in general, there's really two different views in the world, in this country, on that. One is if you focus on division, like some in this administration has, you're going to get more division. If you focus on unity, particularly, you're going to get more of that. I think a good example we know in this state are the good people from Charleston, particularly the families of the massacred who showed us the way of unity. I think they showed us a lesson not just here in South Carolina, but across the country and around the world that if you focus on things to bring people together, that's what you're going to get. And so, yes, do we have an issue in this country that we have to deal with when it comes to race? Absolutely. But we shouldn't confuse that into somehow thinking that that means we shouldn't treat our law enforcement professionals as the great men and women that they are. Because... You see, I got a little pushback about a week ago, because I wrote a column and I talked about the fact that I I raised the concern about the current president not speaking up. You see, right now, when there are men and women in uniform, and a couple weeks back I was in Harris County, Texas, where a sheriff deputy was pumping gas into his car, his squad car, and someone came up and 15 times put bullets into his head like a cold-blooded assassin. And the sheriff down there said he believed it was because it was because that sheriff's deputy was wearing the uniform. If something like that or other things like that across this country happen, every leader we have, be it at the local level, the state level, all the way up to the President of the United States, and for that matter, anyone in the clergy and business and anywhere else needs to step up and say, that is wrong. The men and women who wear the badge are doing the right thing every day, all the time. They protect us. We need to have their back as president. They will have my back every single day. Governor Walker, we're thrilled to bring Governor Haley back on the stage. Hi, Scott. Welcome hey, back to South Carolina. So I have to tell you that Scott, my friend, um, we like to refer to him as Teflon Scott. And the reason is he had three elections in four years, if you remember. And now he's back running again. So, um, <laughs> so we have a couple of things in common. We are both union busters. Why don't you tell us why you had three elections in four years? Yeah, in our case, as Nikki knows, Nikki came up and, and campaigned with me. We had a great time up there, and I appreciate that. I appreciate not only the support politically, financially, and otherwise, but so many of you prayed for me and my, fi my family, my wife, and our two sons, so thank you for that. But the reason we did is because we took on the big government union bosses, we took their power, and we put it into the hands of the hardworking people. That's really what it was all about. And, and I'll tell you, it's interesting from our standpoint, people think it was just about unions, and, and it really was about a transfer of power, but it was also about reform. You see, five years ago in 2010, at the beginning of that year, before I was governor, a young woman named Megan Sampson in the Milwaukee Public School System was named the outstanding first-year teacher in the state. Not long after that, she was laid off. How, how could that be? One of the best and the brightest, one of these new teachers in an urban school district, exactly the kind of person you'd want to have anywhere in the state, let alone in the city of Milwaukee. Well, she was laid off because her old union contract 
which by the way, at that time, all the, all the state government was controlled by a Democrat governor and Democrats in the legislature, and they cut money for schools and gave them no options. So what do they do under the union contract? Last hired, first fired. Last in, first out. One of the things people in America don't know enough about is our reforms ended all that. In Wisconsin now, because of what we did, we can hire and fire based on merit. We can pay based on performance. That means we can put the best and the brightest in our classrooms. But they came after us. They didn't much like that, Nikki. You know that well. She called me a lot and reinforced me because I had, as I mentioned, 100,000 protesters. Death threats, pushback, pushback against my legislature, pushback against our cabinet. We made it through those recalls, we made it through the reelect. And today, what's the old adage? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There were times when I didn't just think that was figurative. I worried a little bit along the way. But we're stronger because of that. And earlier this week on Monday, I laid out a plan to take on the big government union bosses as well as the union bosses across America, not just in Wisconsin something you all can relate to because you led the charge on this. But remember years ago when Boeing was trying to bring, initially trying to bring good jobs into this state? What was one of the entities that stood in the way? The National Labor Relations Board, under our plan, power to the people, not the union bosses, we eliminate the National Labor Relations Board. I'm proud to say that Wisconsin joined South Carolina into being a right-to-work state, but under our plan, we have a presumption that nationally, every state will be a right-to-work state under our plan. And we eliminate the big government unions. You know why? Not just because we've had those battles, but here's why. Because it's important to you as taxpayers. You know, in the most recent year, we have statistics for 3.3 million hours of your time, taxpayers' money paid for 3.3 million hours of time of federal employees to work for union activities. That's $156 million. And I'll give you an example why that's so bad. Think about the Veterans Administration, where we've had something like 600,000, 600,000 veterans waiting for health care, critical crisis in this country. That same year, 250, more than 250 federal employees, more than 250 federal employees were working, including nurses, pharmacists, and healthcare professionals overall, were spending their time 100% on union activities. I say eliminate those unions and get those people to work helping our veterans. Scott, because we're both, um, we have something else in common. We both have Republican houses and Republican senates, and we know that sometimes you have to fight against your own Republicans. I've had to do that in my state. You've had to do that in yours. What's one fight you can tell the people here that you had to fight your own Republicans to try and make a difference in Wisconsin? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but initially on what's now called Act 10, those big union reforms, I remember the, the difference between our state assembly and our state senate well, there's great people in both, but initially the state assembly was new, and so there were 27 new members who'd come in as part of a new majority, and I had joined them as the new governor. And when I came in to tell them how we were gonna take on the big government union bosses, remember that movie Braveheart? <laughs> it was kind of like I had the face paint on, I had the battle charge ready. They were ready to go in. When I went into the state senate, where there were good people like state senator Scott Fitzgerald, the leader there, but there were a few of the senators who weren't quite so excited, it was like I told them their puppy had just died. It wasn't quite the same reaction. But we didn't back down. In fact, the week after the election, we went from all Democrat to all Republican control. I told them then that the voters had made a clear choice. And if we just nibbled around the edges, the voters would have every right to kick us out of office at the next election. It was an open caucus, so the headline the next day said what I said to them, but I, I was glad that it did. I said, it's put up or shut up time. And for us, that's what we need in Washington. Someone to say, it is put up or shut up time. We sent you there for a purpose. It's time to leave this country going forward. Everybody give it up for Teflon Scott Walker.